Welcome back to Men and the City. In today's video, we're going to talk about the BRICS and the rise of a new world order. This is a subject that I've wanted to delve into for a number of months, but I just frankly haven't had the time because I think this is one of the most important issues um, or topics in the world today. And it's going to continue to gain momentum and salience over the next several years and decades. Because I think the entire world is about to change and it's happening already. We're in the midst of this transition. And this factors into a lot of the topics that we discuss on this channel, whether it's masculinity or it's the age of scarcity or it's um, masco nationalism. All of those threads apply to the rise of the BRICS. I want to begin today's video by quoting Christine Lagarde. Christine Lagarde uh, was former director of the International Monetary Fund. She now is the president of the European Central Bank. She's a banker, but as such, she represents the thinking, the consensus in the West regarding what's happening in the East or in Eurasia or in different parts of the world outside of the center of the global financial system, which of course is in Europe and the United States. Listen to what she has to say uh, in this quote. And this, this comes after she was asked about the BRICS and what, what the BRICS union means, how uh, that might manifest itself as a challenge to the dollar, so forth and so on. She said, think for a second about what these countries really have in common in terms of demographics, in terms of geopolitical alliance, in terms of history and background and ask yourself whether they have enough in common to actually volunteer their currency to something that would be jointly organized, cared for, and used in the future. A common currency cannot be just something nice to have that you decide on the flight. It is an expression of your sovereignty. You really have to have something bigger than that, something that brings countries together. I don't think that there is that sort of strong foundation of collective sovereignty that would deliver this single currency. Okay, so with that as the departure point, uh, let me just say a few things right off the bat. This notion of common ideology has so infected the Western world today that it doesn't even have a, a proper sense of its own identity. In other words, the West doesn't have an identity. It's just a part of globalization. It's just a part of this consumer-driven, vulture-capitalist uh, financial system. It doesn't really stand for anything other than democracy and human rights. And even those things are very vague terms. So it's important to frame what Christine Lagarde is actually advocating here, right? Because she's not talking about underlying civilizational commonalities. Those things have been suppressed. They've been undermined. They've been diluted in the West as we know. Okay, so setting that aside, I want to break this video up into a few different parts. The first, we're going to talk about the building blocks. Uh, we're, going to we're going to talk about the, the core competencies of BRICS, how it's come to be. Um, next, we're going to talk about why the BRICS have assembled. Wh what is it that motivates them? What are they trying to accomplish? And uh, by extension, what are they not? Then we're going to talk about what comes next, as I see it, especially as it pertains to this growing financial economic crisis in the West. And finally, we're going to talk about what um, ultimately this BRICS unification and beyond um, really means for the West, or at least for the, the globalized West as, as it exists today. All right. So... In terms of the building blocks, I think it's, it's essential to recognize that the BRICS as, a, as an entity, as a, a collaboration of different countries, and remember it's Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, they have been collaborating, they've been communicating within a framework to some degree of an alliance at least since September of 2006 when they met on the sidelines of a UN assembly meeting. And at that meeting specifically, you had Hu Jintao of China, Medvedev of Russia, Lula da Silva of Brazil, and Mohammed Singh of India. Now, it's noteworthy that today, in all, the, in all these countries, um, the key leaders are basically different, except, of course, in Russia. Medvedev, as we know, was just a mouthpiece for Putin. But uh, setting that aside, what that suggests in and of itself is that this growing collaboration of countries, because that's really what it is, 
transcends individual leaders. It's not just about their personal relationships. Uh, although Narendra Modi, who's currently running India, um, Xi Jinping in China, and uh, Vladimir Putin in Russia, uh, their relationship has only strengthened over time. And that will be conducive to potentially more financial integration. So uh, their next major meeting after this September 2006 um, introduction, you might say, came in December of 2010 when, the South, when South Africa actually joined the BRICS. And then in July of 2014, when they established the new development bank that was modeled on the World Bank. In 2015, they set up something called the Continent Reserve Arrangement, uh, which is modeled on the International Monetary Fund. Uh, part of that introduced the BRICS Cable, which is a fiber optics communications network that allows these countries to communicate with one another. And potentially, going forward, there will be addition, additions to BRICS, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Today, there are as many as 100 meetings that are BRICS related every year. So as you can see, the infrastructure, the framework, um, the relationship building, that has all been in the works for about 20 years. And as I've said in, in, in recurring videos at this stage, it takes about 10 years to build anything. Well, to build anything in states of this size is certainly gonna take multi-decades. Well, we're closing in on that timeline now. Okay, well, what about their specs and capabilities? The BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa um, represent about 3.2 billion people. 3.2 billion people, or 40% of the global population. Wow, that is massive. Uh, they represent 26% of the global supply of oil, 50% of the global supply of iron ore, 40% of the global supply of corn, and 46% of the global supply of wheat. I emphasize some of those metrics in particular because the underpinnings of a developed economy depend upon fossil fuels. They depend upon natural resources, and these countries have them in legion. All right, if 12 additional countries joined, and I'll show this list on the screen, uh, the BRICS would suddenly ascend to about 45% of global oil reserves, 60% of natural gas in the world and have the, com the combined global GDP of almost $30 trillion. So that is considerable indeed. All right, now, what about uh, core competencies? Well, according to the Financial Times, uh, the Chinese core competency mainly is industrial capacity. It's steel, it's manufacturing, it's chemicals, it's high-speed rail, it's aerospace, so forth and so on. What about Russia? Well, Russia is a fossil fuel powerhouse. They have abundant oil and natural gas reserves, as most people know. They have an extremely robust and reorganized military. Um, they have the largest nuclear weapons arsenal in the world. And they have a, a growing infrastructure of higher education, science, and technology. And that, to some degree, is being enriched by a relationship with the Chinese and the Indians as well. What about India? Well, India's core competencies, you might say, are in software. They're in pharmaceuticals and other high-tech industries. And of course, that brings us to Brazil. And Brazil, like Russia, is a natural resources powerhouse. And that is especially the case in minerals and water. So if you add all of these dimensions together, you have the makings of an alliance that the world really hasn't ever seen before coming from the East. All right. Why BRICS? Why now? Well, there's a very good paper that I'll link to below called Can BRICS De-Dollarize the Global Financial System? And there's a, there's a lot in there regarding these relationships, uh, the pros and cons of these alliances, the implications of de-dollarization, so forth and so on. But one of the quotes that, that uh, they reference in that article, or in that essay, I should say, comes from the former governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney. Mark Carney told bankers at Jackson Hole in 2019 that the dollar's dominance is the destabilizing asymmetry growing at the heart of the international monetary and financial system. So what, what exactly did he mean by that? Well, 
we know that the dollar dominates global trade. We know that the vast majority of transactions in the world are settled in dollars. Uh, we also know that because the global financial system is centered in New York, London, and Swiss banks, uh, or in, uh, you might say, the, the, Bundes, the Bundesbank in Germany, we know that the West has outsized power. And how have they leveraged this power? Well, they have weaponized this power as they see fit. And this is most acutely demonstrated by the United States, which has sanctioned all five members of the BRICS at one time or another. So you can see the, the underpinnings for this alliance beginning to manifest, can't you? Well, I think there are four main reasons that the BRICS are coalescing as we speak. The first is political autonomy. And I think this is the most important. I'm gonna emphasize this more in just a moment. But political autonomy basically means that these nation states, these civilizational um, keystones, if you will, they want to operate with independence. They don't want their sovereign power to be interceded upon by the West. That is their main objection to the current global order. Second, there is a recognition of multipolarity. So it makes sense that India and China and Brazil and South Africa uh, and Russia want a sphere of influence that they can control and dominate, especially as it pertains to their national economic interests. The third is that it's an escape valve. Um, the West has severe financial problems, which we'll get into more in just a moment, and I've talked at length about on this channel. But if everything is tied to this outsized financial system in the West and that system blows up, well, you can imagine the ripple effects around the world will be seismic. And these countries, India, China, Russia, so forth and so on, they are less developed. They are not quite as homogenous uh, in a social economic sense as we are, meaning they have huge swaths of the population that are poor. So any disruption to that system could cause outsized damage in their part of the world. So they need an escape valve. Fourth, defense. It's not a surprise, um, well, I should say, it is a surprise to people in the West to, to think of us to some degree as the aggressors, but that is exactly what we've been over the last 30 years in particular. We have intervened in the affairs of states around the world. We have a global presence, especially uh, in the form of the U.S. military, which has something like 800 bases in 100 countries around the world. This is cause for alarm. Now, it's hard for us in the West to understand this because we see things in good guy terms. We think we're the good guys. We're trying to bring about positive global change. But that's not the way the rest of the world increasingly sees it. And of course, the collateral damage of our interventions in the Middle East, um, in uh, other parts of Latin America and Eastern Europe have not uh, established a track record of credibility for the United States, now has it. All right, so what are the BRICS not? If they are this attempt at establishing a broader alliance for defensive purposes, for political autonomy, for multipolarity, for um, an off-ramp, if you will, if things go wrong in the West. What the BRICS are not, and this is according to Jim Ricards, uh, they're not a petro yuan, they're not a petro ruble. In other words, they're not yet, uh, as of today, they're not taking commodities and tethering their currencies to them. They are, as opposed to that, not just a political alliance, but an attempt to establish a a monetary union of sorts so that they can trade with one another. Second, they are not a new gold standard. Now this could change as well, but for the moment, the distribution of gold in the world uh, continues to favor the West, at least if you believe the official numbers that we have in the United States. The US has more gold than anybody else, um, but we'll come back to that in just a moment. It does not mark the end of the US dollar or the Euro and it is not a coordinated fiscal policy or an international bond market. It is an international trade union. So these countries want to remain the, the, the fundamental constituent parts of any alliance. There will not be the supranational organization which you see in the West. Now, Christine Lagarde may regard that as a weakness, 
But I, in fact, think it is quite a strength because the international institutions in the West have done tremendous damage to the sovereign entities underneath them. Now, haven't they? Whether that's the United States or it's the Eurozone um, impeding on the affairs of France or Germany. And there's growing discontent with these international organizations as a result. All right. All that sounds good, but are there notable problems? Yeah, of course there are problems. Um, any attempt to de-dollarize would in and of itself bring tremendous disruption. So as, uh, as Russian President Putin said a couple years ago, Russia did not want to give up the dollar as the reserve currency or means of payment. It was forced to do so. Now that's an important point in large measure because these countries stand for reform. They do not advocate for expansion or disruption. And that is a common theme that you hear bandied about in the West, whether it's in the, inside the military industrial complex or it's in, uh, you might say, the nonprofits of Washington, D.C. or the, the political science halls of Ivy League schools. They perceive the BRICS who represent the rise of civilizations of old as a threat to their global order, but they are not. They are reformers, and in many respects, they perceive us as the threat. All right. Um, the principal disadvantage of these countries is that they are quite different. And that uh, does not in any way, shape, or form, contrary to what Lagarde said, mean that they cannot align with one another. It does, however, mean that they're going to have to remain separate and distinct within the confines of a broader alliance. Now, I don't regard that as a deal breaker by any means. These are countries that have bordered each other in some cases for thousands of years. So there is muscle memory. They do practice diplomacy. And that's what BRICS really is. It's a framework for these different countries to resolve their differences and ultimately trade with one another. But they are different. And those differences do matter. And they will cause some degree of um, tension or friction as this alliance grows and grows. It's also important to note that part of the, the continuity, part of, part of the, uh, the rationale for this alliance, part of what's strengthening it, is a collective fear of the West and the interference in their affairs domestically. All right, so what happens next? Well, as I've said repeatedly on this channel, it is my view that, that we're witnessing the demolition of the legacy financial system concentrated in the West. And we're beginning to see challenges to the Western global order emerge all over the world, whether that's the war in Ukraine or it's the war in the Middle East or it's uh, the Western banking crisis and the subsequent realization of the BRICS to de-dollarize. All of these things demonstrate that there is a new world order afoot. And indeed, I think there is. The question is, what comes next? If, in fact, these tectonic plates are shifting, does that necessitate that there's going to be a war or conflict, so forth and so on? Not necessarily. It depends on how that permutation occurs. But my sense is that the BRICS are really getting ready for the collapse of the legacy fiat system. That's really their push. It's an effort to weather the storm as that system demolitions. Because remember, they're not trying to destroy it. They're not trying to create an alternative to the dollar. That's not their motivation. Their motivation, however, is to weather the storm as the United States, as Germany and France and these other countries careen fiscally out of control and tank the system, as well as putting up a defensive line. Now, in, in conclusion, I, I, want, I want to dispel a few um, myths about the BRICS countries that I think are, are crucial to understand, the most important of which is that they are a force of disruption. So here I'm going to go back to the Financial Times. BRICS countries share the common value of reform and development. Reform is meant to improve the global economic order to reform the unfair, unreasonable, and imperfect aspects of the old governance systems. They are not revolutionaries, they are reformers. And finally, and this is a point I just made a moment ago, the BRICS do not seek to replace the United States, replace the West, or replace the existing international order, but hope that the current international order can adapt to the new era through reform. Adaptation 
less so revolutionary change. And as such, what the BRICS is in conclusion is a kind of Eastern Monroe Doctrine. So if you remember the president of the United States in the 1820s, uh, President Monroe, put forth a doctrine that basically said that the United States is, control, is in control of its own hemisphere, its, its own um, neighborhood, if you will, and any European powers that interfere in that hemisphere will provoke conflict with the United States. That is what the BRICS ultimately are trying to achieve. They're trying to draw lines in the sand across which the West can no longer cross. And if they do, there will be consequences. All right. Uh, I want to finish with a joint statement made by China and Russia a couple years ago that I think does an excellent job of outlining the modus operandi and the rationalization, the strategy for the BRICS and Eurasia and these other potential alliances that could come online. Today, the world is going through momentous changes and humanity is entering a new era of rapid development and profound transformation. It sees the development of such processes and phenomena as multipolarity, economic globalization, the advent of information society, cultural diversity, transformation of the global governance architecture and world order. A trend has emerged towards redistribution of power in the world. And the international community is showing a growing demand for the leadership aiming at peaceful and gradual development. Some actors representing but the minority on the international scale continue to advocate unilateral approaches to addressing international issues and resort to force. They interfere in the internal affairs of other states, infringing their legitimate rights and interests and incite contradictions, differences and confrontations, thus hampering the development and progress of mankind against the opposition from the international community. In short, the West's bark is beyond its bite. The world has changed and there needs to be a reordering. However, that reordering should come about through reform and adaptation, not through war and conflict. Now, whether it does or it does not, it remains to be seen. And there is tremendous cause for concern, not least of which because of these bubbling conflicts emerging in the Middle East and in Eastern Europe. But the BRICS are about reform. They are about an international monetary union that can facilitate communication and trade within their spheres of influence. They are not about global dominion and control. And in the final analysis, they are not trying to replace the dollar system. They are, however, trying to survive its demolition. And they're going to do so most likely by leveraging the, the most ancient of, of monies in the world, and that is gold. But that is a subject that we'll address in subsequent videos. Stay tuned for more, and we'll talk soon.